So yeah, I think this is a really good time to jump into the next section here and talk about Martin Ling's. Um, so I've got here, this is uh, him in the middle. Uh, this is taken, I think, the year before he died. Uh, you have uh, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf there on the right. And then I cannot remember the brother who's on the left. Um, he's another uh, wonderful scholar, though. Um, so this is Martin Ling's. Uh, Martin Ling's was a uh, convert uh, from England. Uh, he died in 2005. He was born in 1909. And uh, the name he took when he converted to Islam was Abu Bakr Siraj al-Din. So actually, you'll see this in some of his early books. He didn't use his name Martin Lings. Um, instead, he used his name Abu Bakr Siraj al-Din. Um, so one of his earliest books is called uh, The Book of Certainty. And he actually put, he didn't put Martin Lings on that. He put Abu Bakr Siraj al-Din. He was born to a Protestant family uh, from, I believe, Manchester, if I remember correctly. Uh, however, he grew up primarily in America because his father was employed with a company over here. He moved back for schooling and was a young scholar at Magdalen College, Oxford, the wonderful university there. During probably the end of its golden era from the past century, because what was he studying? Uh, some of you guys might recognize some of these names, but he was studying English, English language, English literature. Um, in interviews that he gave, uh, it, it's actually kind of funny. He jokes about how poor of a student he was um, for most of his undergrad until about his last year or two there uh, when he and one of his dear friends finally kind of settled on English literature as their, uh, their focus. And that was through some of the professors that were there, uh, namely C.S. Lewis. You may have heard this name before. He was a, uh, an atheist when he started uh, as a professor at, uh, at Oxford. And uh, the famous author and philologist, linguist, uh, J.R.R. Tolkien, uh, helped Lewis convert to Christianity, and uh, Lewis, Tolkien, and Richards were the head of the English department during Lings's time at Oxford, and Lings got his uh, English literature degree directly under uh, C.S. Lewis, so they actually were uh, friends. Um, for those of you who are familiar with the kind of uh, academic writing club that Tolkien, Lings, and Richards started called the Inklings there in Oxford. Um, it is reported that Lings actually attended a few of those meetings there uh, of that group um, while he was a student. So uh, that, that's just a little bit of cool stuff about Lings and some of his connections there to some of the best classicists uh, of the past century. Um, now, while he was at Oxford, he became introduced to the writings of two people, René Gunion and Frithel Schoen, uh, a German and a French philosophers, metaphysicians, both of whom had uh, been part of what you would call the Orientalist circle and had converted to Islam. Uh, they were espousing kind of a new direction of Orientalist philosophy, which became known as the perennialist philosophy to this day. And uh, their writings particularly were what encouraged Lings to start looking at Islam. And after he graduated, he went and took up a teaching position in Lithuania, was actually able to meet with Shuan at Shuan's um, Zawiya, which is kind of like a uh, kind of like a masjid, it's an Islamic center in a way uh, that he had established in Basel, Germany. Uh, so they met in, I believe it was thirty nine. I think I have it here. Or thirty eight. Yeah, thirty eight. Um, yeah, in nineteen thirty eight uh, is when uh, he gets to meet with Shuan in Basel, and that's when he officially converts to Islam. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. And so this is, this is good to note here. Um, 
so Rene Guen, uh, Guenyun and Fraser Shuan, they were both students of Sheikh Ahmed Al Alwi, who was an Algerian Sheikh uh, and scholar. And he was probably at his time, one of the most significant scholars in Islam. Um, although he was not necessarily well known, he was probably more well known to the French since Algeria at the time was a French colony. And um, that was particularly how uh, Guignon and Chouan uh, were introduced to him through their circles there. So um, after his conversion, Lings um, is instructed by Chouan to go and meet with uh, Guignon in Cairo, uh, which is where he was studying with other um, followers of Sheikh Alawi. Alawi had passed away at this point and um, the majority of uh, his uh, students were in Cairo, uh, along with other scholars. You know, Cairo is and has been for a very, very long time a center of Islamic knowledge there in the Al Azhar area. Um, I was blessed to get to go and visit that area a couple of years back. And it is indeed a historic place. If you guys ever get the chance, I would highly recommend it. And what, what is really cool is that um, this time in the 30s, the 40s, right before World War II, this was in, in, in Egypt kind of considered like the golden era. So Lings himself was in Egypt, probably during one of the best points in modern Egyptian history which is really, really beautiful. So um, yeah, in, from 39 to 52, uh, he stayed there right up until the Egyptian revolution, at which point he had to flee. He studied, uh, lived with uh, Guignan. His, his friend, his best friend from Oxford had actually converted a couple years before him through the same uh, converts, uh, the French and German uh, philosopher converts. Um, and had taken up a teaching position at the University of Cairo. He went and was visiting with him. His friend unfortunately dies in a freak Campbell accident and Lings gets offered his friend's post to teach Shakespeare at the University of Cairo. And so that's where he stayed for a number of years. He got married in 44 and um, his teacher there, Gunyan, dies in 51. Uh, they actually lived, uh, Gunyan had an estate out uh, west of the pyramids, apparently uh, west of Giza, where uh, they resided together and studied. Um, and, and Gunyan had um, benefited, he had migrated, I think, and was, had been living there since like the late 20s, I believe, if I remember correctly, and he had gotten to meet and study with so many different scholars. Um, the list was just huge uh, that I had I was able to find. And anyhow, the the knowledge that these guys had is really really cool. Uh, so alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, we're, we're benefited to be uh, that, that Lings was able to connect with these people at the time that he did. Alhamdulillah. So yeah, this is actually really cool. Lings basically um, got to establish the Shakespeare department because he taught Shakespeare. Uh, to the Egyptians at the Cairo University. They got to put on uh, Shakespeare plays that the king uh, loved to attend, apparently. Um, and this was a highlight that Lings always talked about later in his life because uh, Shakespeare was kind of the thing that he loved, which he'd gotten from Lewis at Oxford and continued. He actually wrote a couple of books on Shakespeare as well. Um, actually, they're, they're quite interesting. We'll look at those here in just a moment. His first book, however, was The Book of Certainty, and he published this as soon as he got back to London uh, in 52. Uh, and The Book of Certainty is a book basically on Islamic creed. I haven't actually finished reading it, but this is a really cool book because in 76, I believe it was, in 76, a young Mark Hansen picks up this book in California, and a year later, due to his interest peaked from reading this book, converts to Islam and becomes whom is today, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. So um, 
it's it's really cool kind of to see how this all transpires to where we're at today with chaotic here islam in the west first through lings and then through sheikh hamza yusuf's uh, some of their the work that they have done in dawa alhamdulillah um, so this was the first book he published and uh, immediately upon arriving back in London, he starts studying for his doctorate at SOAS uh, University uh, of London. And this is the, uh, the big university in London on Oriental uh, uh, Science, Oriental and Asiatic uh, Studies, I think. It's, you know, it's, it's the big uh, place there in London. I forget the exact def uh, what the acronym stands for. Um, he gets He's there for about six years, uh, working on his PhD in Arabic, uh, graduates in 59, and then starts working at the British Museum. Uh, the doctorate he did was actually on Sheikh Alawi, later gets published as the book titled The Sufi Saint of the 20th Century in 93. Uh, this is a really cool book. I actually have a copy of it uh, right here. Um, so if you're looking a little bit more into a lot of the depth of the spiritual tradition, um, Sufism to Sawuf, this is, uh, another science like Sirah, uh, in Islam and other of the Islamic sciences, this one's particularly related to, uh, what we may be familiar with from like the Hadith Jabril, uh, talking about the three aspects of the religion, Islam, Imam, and Isan. Uh, this science is particularly related to this, uh, aspect of Isan and how we're able to develop excellence within ourselves, spiritual excellence. Um, so this is a, a very good uh, book on that topic, uh, very detailed. It, it, the, the publication version is kind of a, a softened version, but it, it's a full-on doctoral thesis, which is really cool to read if that's something you're interested in as an academic. Um, so yeah, so he goes on and starts working at the British Museum uh, and the British Library as well, becoming the keeper of Oriental books and manuscripts. And some of you may know from history, the British Empire had, in World War I, conquered a vast majority of the Muslim world, the Ottoman Empire, and in that had collected quite a lot of Arabic texts. And so Lings had the ability to sit through, uh, sift through and kind of discover, read a lot of these ancient texts. Um, he later goes and publishes two books on Arabic calligraphy and some of the uh, beautiful ornamenting uh, of writing. If, if any of you have studied or, or have looked at uh, calligraphy, there's absolute wonders in the Arabic language, just of the art artistry uh, that goes into writing and just the beauty that people have put throughout time into making beautiful uh, copies of the Quran, uh, of books of Sirah, Tafsir, uh, Hadith, all sorts of beautiful books. <clears throat> In 83 is when his uh, book, the, the one that we're studying, uh, Muhammad, Salam, his life based on his earliest sources, gets published. And within just a couple of years, it becomes a classic, uh, like I mentioned earlier, uh, there were awards that were given in Egypt and in uh, Pakistan uh, for, for the, the dawah that he basically was able to do uh, by writing this book and uh, translating Ibn Hisham basically into the English language. Uh, and he was then able to get a lot of students in both Cairo and in Pakistan, and he traveled back and forth between those countries quite a lot in his later years. Two of the Shakespeare books that he wrote uh, later. Uh, he also taught and lectured quite a lot up until his last years. Um, in fact, I think it was like two weeks before he died, he was at the Globe giving a lecture on Shakespeare. Um, so two of the books are Sacred Art of Shakespeare and The Secret of Shakespeare. These are primarily on uh, how to read spirituality of Shakespeare in a lot of his plays. Uh, it's a very, very cool thing. I've read portions of both of them and they're, they're really neat. Uh, really good books. I think definitely if you are a Muslim looking into uh, the the arts, uh, whether that's through theater, acting, uh, music, anything, you, these books I think would probably be uh, required as a Muslim to read. Um, and then he continued publishing. He was very prolific in the latter years of his life. Uh, 11th Hour is a book that he wrote uh, and published in 2002 on 
uh, his thoughts about the past century and looking forward into the future and where we were at in terms of probably, uh, you know, a lot of people talk about the end of the world coming up and uh, the return of the Mahdi, uh, and Jesus coming back and things like that. And so this is this is a book that he wrote kind of about that. Uh, one, one of the important, and I, I think probably the biggest highlight from this book, I just wanted to share with everyone, is that the, the main significant thing that he recognized was that when he was growing up in, as a child, religion was a commonplace practice for everyone in society. And that uh, by 2002, uh, the time he's writing this book, uh, it, 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 it's hardly something ever discussed uh, in, in culture. And this was, the, I think, his main highlight is that we need to get back to prayer whatever religion you're from, whether that's Jew, Muslim, Christian, Hindu, Buddhist, whatever, we need to get back to making religion an integral part of our societies. So that uh, that's kind of his main highlight, if I remember correctly from this book. It was the main thing that I drew from it and others have, have uh, referenced. And then um, the last book, this was actually published posthumously. He had, he had just submitted, I think, the final copy to his publisher right before he passed away. Uh, Sheikh Hamza talks about um, having received news of Ling's uh, passing and then receiving his copy in the mail the next day um, with an, a request from Ling's to write a um, kind of a, a forward to the book or something like that. <clears throat> Sheikh Hamza Yusuf also um, talking about him on uh, Lings's passing. Uh, Sheikh Hamza was the one who wrote the kind of famous obituary. Um, I'll be sharing that as a supplementary reading if anyone's interested. But uh, the main issue that a lot of people were concerned about, and a lot of people talked about Lings in the West here as someone who was either good or bad. You, you'll have people talk about this with, I think, any scholar that, oh, there, there's things that, uh, we should take from this person. He's really good. And then others will say, oh, no, you have to avoid him. Be careful about him. He, he says these things that are, that are against the religion. And I think Sheikh Holmes's view here, on, view here on this is actually really good. And these are just a couple quotes that he had in his obituary that he wrote um, that I wanted to read. Dr. Lings was a man of small physical stature, as if God had created him to be close to the earth he loved and tended but he was a celestial intellectual and a spiritual giant in an age dwarfed <clears throat> of dwarfed terrestrial aspirations and endeavors. I was not interested in whatever differences we might have in astute points of creed. I wanted only to learn from his gentle and upright character. And then at another point in the obituary, he writes, both Habib Ali and I felt that while Dr. Lings's view on perennialism was not mainstream, it was not a complete rejection of the classical Islamic position, which holds that previous religious dispensations were abrogated by the final message of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And certainly his own conversion to Islam indicated this. So the, the main criticism that you will find of Ling's is the perennialist philosophy that he uh, tends to, to espouse and is definitely present in his writings. And the main part of this is that Ling's view on other religions was that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his wisdom saw that these religions were supposed to exist today because there was still some benefit in them that could be derived. And this could simply just be as much as that they point to Islam and they point to the prophet, ultimately. Um, Allahu alam. And I think this was ultimately what uh, Lings uh, and Hamza, uh, Sheikh Hamza, uh, uh, were pointing to in their disagreement on this topic. Sheikh Hamza obviously took the traditional perspective that all other religions have been abrogated and Islam is the, uh, the last and, and uh, ultimate message. Uh, Lings was a little bit more open on that. Uh, saying that uh, the other religions have points that can point towards the truth. There are some Christians, Jews, perhaps Hindus, Buddhists that, that may be rightly guided uh, and may well indeed uh, uh, attain salvation through their prophets of those religions. Um, 
But uh, the important thing here is that because uh, Sheikh Hamza and, and Martin Lings actually did get to talk about these in person at one point. And uh, although they had a discussion and disagreed on their perspectives, they were true Muslims and scholars and recognized that, look, we don't have to uh, anathesize each other for our disagreement on this, because this is an, uh, as Hamza Yusuf points out here, this is an abstruse point of creed. It's not a foundational point. It, it's not something that is a make or break deal in the religion. Uh, if, if anything, uh, Ling's is, was able to well defend his position and uh, reliably have his own ishtihad, which is a foundation of opinion in terms of uh, making a, a judgment on it from his own scholarship. Another point, I think uh, Hamza Yusuf mentions how he, he didn't even want to really discuss it uh, because of his youth and Ling's age uh, and the fact that it, he was a senior and that uh, all Sheikh Hamza wanted to do was, was learn from just being in his presence. So just some of the respect that the scholars have among themselves. I think this is something that honestly we should look at in our day and age when we're uh, talking with others, uh, whether that is others of another religion or others of our own religion who may differ slightly with us in minor points of creed. Um, that ultimately, uh, and, and particularly here in our, our book that we are reading, on the life of the Prophet, Allah uh, Salam. The important matters are those that are well agreed upon, and all of us ultimately do agree upon. Uh, we all agree upon Allah, the oneness of Allah. We all agree upon the the Prophet being the last and final messenger. We all agree that um, the Quran is the word of Allah the message from Allah that it was revealed. We believe in the book and we all believe in the, the angels in the unseen realm, angels and jinn. And we also all believe in the, the final last day of judgment. And these, these are the most important things. And if uh, there are other matters that we can have in our own personal lives that, that we, we tend to think about, then that is, that, is, that is fine and that can be up to us. But ultimately the religion is very simple and does not need to be too complex. And I think it's a beautiful thing that amongst the scholars, we have an example here between these two people uh, of how to uh, professionally uh, agree to disagree on a topic. One final last thing I want to do before I open up to any questions on this aspect is share with you guys here, this is an example of Isnat. So this is Ling's Isnat here uh, for his own scholarship that he learned. Uh, and this is tracing directly to uh, back to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam there at the very top. And as you can see, this goes down through a whole bunch of different people. There's some common names here you might recognize. Uh, there's Ali. Uh, uh, the, the companion, the, the nephew of the prophet, there's Abu Bakr, you've got Anas bin Malik, uh, you've got someone of Farsi, uh, um, you've got the grandchildren of the prophet through kind of the whole uh, lineage there are on one side, um, you, you've got other people uh, in here, you've got Jafar as um, I, this is five generations down if I remember right, very important uh, descendant of the prophet uh, and scholar in the religion. Uh, you've got other figures like um, Abu Qasim al-Junaid, um, Abu Qadr Jalani, um, uh, Abu Hassan al-Shadili. There, there's, there's quite a lot of people in here. Um, and then, of course, it, down at the very end of it is uh, the uh, Algerian scholar, Abun <coughs> Ahmed Ibn Mustafa al-Alawi, whom... Uh, was able to convert both Shuan and Gunyan, and then subsequently Ling's uh, becoming a convert as well through them. And then, then ultimately also Sheikh Hamza, uh, also part of this, this is not to a degree. Um, although one person, as you can kind of see here, what's beautiful, like if you just look at, um, kind of here where it breaks down in the middle, you've got 
Abdul Hassan Al Shadili. Uh, this he was a, he was an Egyptian uh, scholar, very important scholar in Egyptian history, uh, Islamic history, and he's got all of these different chains going back in multiple different directions. So as scholars, uh, the more kind of chains, more isnads that you can collect amongst yourself, the stronger uh, it is that you are as a scholar. Uh, and this is just an example of one of those. And uh, some scholars have more. Uh, this is at least one that uh, was shared. This actually comes from the back of uh, the thesis that uh, uh, Dr. Ling's wrote here on uh, Sheikh Alawi. Uh, so just wanted to share that with you guys. Do so you kind of have an example of what Isnads uh, actually are? <clears throat> 